My name's uh, Trevor Bernard. I'm the director of the Wilberforce uh, Institute um, and a specialist in transatlantic slavery. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be able to talk about another aspect of slavery in the Atlantic world, uh, indigenous slavery in the Atlantic world. And we've got a, a fine panel of, of, of four very distinguished speakers, uh, whom Brooke Newman, um, a long time associate of the Wilberforce Institute, uh, has brought together. And I'd like to thank Brooke for, for particularly for um, for for putting together this panel. Um, so if, if the panelists wanted to just show themselves for, for a little bit and then I'll, I'll introduce Rebecca uh, next. Uh, just to say a, a couple of things about uh, the subject of today's, today's uh, seminar, uh, today's webinar and why it's so important for the Wilberforce Institute uh, and for the study of slavery and enslavement in general. Uh, I think we're, we're quite aware that the study of slavery is going through some transformative changes uh, at the moment. Uh, and one of those biggest transformative changes uh, is the recognition that slavery not only existed uh, in many places and in many times, uh, but it was very, very different type of slavery uh, in, in, in those sorts of places. And indeed, one of the things uh, that we're very proud of uh, in regard to uh, the Wilberforce Institute uh, is uh, the role of our ex-director, uh, Professor David Richardson, and putting forward the Cambridge World History of Slavery, um, which, which takes slavery from ancient times all through to the most recent times. One of the most interesting, and I think one of the most dynamic areas of research into slavery uh, in the period of the 17th and 18th century into the Atlantic world uh, from, from Columbus through to the mid 19th century, uh, is a topic of indigenous slavery. It was in the past, I think, overshadowed, and still to an extent today is overshadowed by uh, the more prominent part of, of, of transatlantic slavery. But a whole host of scholars, including people who are talking tonight, uh, have, have come to show that indigenous slavery in the Americas is uh, different from transatlantic slavery, extremely important, uh, and important not only in the history of slavery, but also in the history of shaping early America, uh, the early Americas and the Atlantic world. Uh, so tonight is a, is a wonderful opportunity uh, to go over these particular topics. And we have uh, four very distinguished speakers and I'll introduce uh, each one in turn. Each one will talk for about 10 minutes, uh, leaving us for lots of times for questions. Um, so if I can introduce firstly, uh, Rebecca Gertz, uh, who is Associate Professor at, 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 the, at NYU University uh, in, in New York um, and is an expert uh, not just on indigenous slavery, which is a, a relatively new area of, of interest for her, uh, but in the history of, of the Chesapeake, uh, of, of race, of slavery and religion uh, in those areas. Uh, she wrote a, a fantastic book just a very, a, a little, on 17th century Virginia, not long ago, the baptism of early Virginia, uh, talking about, about race and particularly its connections with religion uh, in, those, in those areas. Uh, she's now involved very strong, very much in the history of indigenous slavery. Uh, it's a new project. And she want her title to the, the title of her talk today uh, is Enslaved Native People uh, in the Archive. So over to you, Rebecca. We're delighted to have you uh, join the Wilberforce Institute. Thank you so much for that, Trevor. Um, good morning, everyone. I say good morning because it is still morning and not even lunchtime here in New York City. Um, but good afternoon to everybody who's joining us from the UK um, and other parts of Europe. I want to talk today about questions of presence and absence and the work I am currently doing on enslaved people in the Caribbean. Enslaved Native people are already difficult to see in the archive, even as the flowering of this scholarship in the last 15 to 20 years has begun to expose how depressingly common enslavement of Native people by Europeans was. And even as we become aware that Native enslavement happened throughout the Americas from 1492, 1492 until, as human trafficking research is showing, the present moment. There is so much that we do not know. Currently researching the lives of enslaved indigenous people in the pearl fisheries of the southern Caribbean. Um, and Claire, if you could pop that map up. Um, these fisheries, though far from the seat of Spanish power in the Caribbean at Santo Domingo, are fairly well documented. 
Um, so there we can see that what we're talking about, um, what's um, currently Colombia and Venezuela. Um, you see Trinidad um, up there in the northeastern corner of the map um, and the island of Margarita um, um, kind of towards the center. Um, in this rather traditional archive, um, made up mostly of judicial proceedings and complaints, I am able to begin reconstructing the lives of enslaved indigenous people. Sometimes enslaved indigenous people appear in the archives as lists of names. On the October 31st, 1550, a native woman named Kitri Zika made a statement to two Spanish officials as part of an investigation into illegal slaving activities. They wrote quite simply, Beatrice Zika, an Indian woman, said she is Guaykitty. The officials who spoke to her also added that she must, quote, be about 30 years old. We hear Beatrice Zika's voice only as the faintest whisper in the archive, in a moment in which she briefly speaks her name and her origins, and a notary wrote her responses down in the third person, as was traditional. Her age was not her own to divulge, and perhaps she did not know it. If she said more to them, um, perhaps about how she came to live in Diego Caballero's household in Panama, far away from her island, on the, her home on the island of Margarita, which you can see there on the map, they did not record it. In total, 49 native men, women, and children, ranging in age from nursing infants to around 50 years old, lived and worked against their will on Caballeros' pearl fishing station in Nata on Panama's Pacific coast. Nata is over a thousand miles as the crow flies from the island of Margarita, where Beatriz Zika's people, the Guayquiri, lived. In this 1550 investigation, all the indigenous people Spanish um, officials interviewed insisted on identifying their origins, even though officials eschewed indigenous ethnonyms in favor of the generic Indio. For example, um, one man said, um, whom the Spanish identified as Antonio, an Indio, Antonio, an Indian, said he was from Piritu, uh, which is on the coast of what's now Colombia. Most of these people had been enslaved for years, possibly decades, in pearl fisheries belonging to the Caballero family. Behind these names and behind the insistence of these native men and women to identify their origins and affiliations is a legacy of violence, enslavement, and resistance. By establishing their genealogies and their kinship relations on paper, um, by identifying themselves with indigenous communities, some of which had been destroyed by the Spanish a generation before, these men and women were making a statement about their survival, even if the Spanish did not understand what they were doing. Beatriz Zica, who said that she was Guayquerí, and somebody like Francisquito, um, who said he was from Piritu, and all of their compatriots insisted on their own ways of describing themselves and their own ways of being, even in the midst of enslavement and extreme dislocation from their natal communities. This list of names is in the Archivo General de Indias, um, and it is in thus an eloquent testimony of Native voices, of Native people seizing an opportunity to articulate not just their names, but their sense of themselves and collectively their pasts haunted by Spanish slaving and colonizing. In this, the archive tells us more than its creators intended. These lists of names, of which there are many um, for this period, are both frustrating and tantalizing for they hint at the wealth of the stories behind them. Most of the time, Spanish officials did little to establish enslaved <coughs> indigenous people's backgrounds beyond their names and ages. Yet in 1570, a judicial investigator commissioned to look into con conditions for enslaved indigenous people and the possible illegality of their enslavement took a novel approach. Like most judges, he came up with a list of set questions he would ask every witness, and witnesses were sworn to keep these questions secret from other possible deponents. But unlike other judges, this investigator decided to interview enslaved indigenous people in, in addition to Spanish slaveholders. His interviews comprise hundreds of pages of testimony from enslaved indigenous people. Though refracted through the notaries who took their testimonies, and sometimes through the translators, um, with some, some of these people were speaking in indigenous languages and the words were translated into Spanish. Um, and these notaries also kind of take their testimony and couch it into more polite language. So it's definitely refracted. Um, this archive comprises the first sustained account of the daily lives and personal histories of enslaved indigenous people in the Americas written um, even though at one remove from their own voices. <clears throat> 
some of the questions that the judicial investigator wanted to ask had to do with how were you captured? When were you captured? Do you remember being branded? Do you remember your own language? Have you been exposed to Christianity? Do you believe in God? What would you do if you were no longer enslaved and were allowed to become an Indio Libre, um, a free Indian? Um, and so all of these questions were asked of um, dozens of indigenous people in 1570. These people sometimes recalled the moments of capture during judicial interviews. Many of these people, had, having lived long enough to be questioned in 1570, had been, question, had been captured in, say, 1530 or 1535, and they were children when they were first enslaved. A man named Andres Granada was seven and sound asleep during the slave raid on his village. He later awoke terrified in the arms of a stranger. Miguel Malibu was an adolescent when he was captured. He was in a canoe with a friend when a Spanish slave vessel intercepted them. Miguel told investigators that he initially learned he would be sold in Española, but that winds were not right, and so he was sold in Cabo de la Vela instead, so there along um, the northern coast of, of Colombia. Slavers captured Pedro de Cumapacare when he was an adult. His captor was a Spanish soldier working with a small group of native men from a rival polity to capture and sell slaves to Spanish slavers. Pedro described his terror at his inability to fight off his Spanish and native captors. Luis, on the other hand, did not remember where he came from. He was too young to recall his native community, his native name, um, and his native tongue. Enslaved native people who spoke about the moment of branding emphasized it as a moment of absolute and terrifying change that fundamentally transformed their relationships to their former selves and former communities. Pedro Perdiconato, captured while away from his home village of Mexiragua, was branded only on his arrival in Cabo de la Vela. For Pedro, the act of branding seems to have been the moment in which he understood he was enslaved. So instead of the moment of capture being the most terrifying moment, it was instead the moment when he was branded. Um, another man named Francisco recalled being branded shortly after his capture, probably sometime in the early 1550s. Francisco contracted smallpox and his extensive facial scars occluded the brand. So his slaveholder petitioned and received permission to have Francisco rebranded. This had just happened when Francisco was questioned. The notary added a side note that Francisco's face was red and infected. Enslaved native people described the quotidian violence of the pearl fisheries in their own words, describing beatings with whips or clubs, kicking, hair pulling, biting, um, and being locked in stocks. Gonzalo, a native man who said he was from the island of Margarita, which is there in the northeastern corner of your map, said that he could not run away, quote, because he did not know the land and because he was afraid of being whipped. The work of enslaved native women began early in the morning as they were roused to cook maize um, or corn for divers and for enslaved children well before dawn. The women also grew, preserved, and cooked maize washed and sewed clothing for enslaved men and slaveholders alike, and cared for enslaved children and sick divers. One enslaved woman named Catalina described the sexual predations of Spanish slaveholders. She spent months protecting her young daughter from a rapacious slaveholder before managing to send her away to relatives at a neighboring rancheria. Um, and this is one of the more horrifying um, stories that I have uncovered in this particular part of the archive. Um, and I can imagine how intimidating it was for her to have to go before these Spanish judges and talk about this. Um, though the investigating judge promised protection, some of the enslaved were too terrified to speak. One man named Dominguito simply repeated the Our Father and Hail Mary prayers over and over again, refusing to answer any questions. But for most of the enslaved, this judicial proceeding offered the promise of liberation. The judge asked specifically what indigenous people would do if they were freed. Uh, Catalina spoke of, this is a different Catalina, um, spoke of returning to her homeland and searching for her siblings. Isabel de la Ramada wished to live with her three daughters. Juana's mixed race daughter, Ines, was a free woman living with her mixed race husband in Rio de la Hacha. Isabel wanted to live with them and care for her grandchildren. These respondents and many others emphasized preserving kinship relationships and reconstituting communities outside of Spanish control. The judicial investigation of 1570 generated a report on the conditions of enslaved indigenous people in Cabo de la Vela. 
and also established that most of these people were held in violation of the new laws of 1542, which were generally understood to have ended indigenous slavery in the Spanish Americas. Though it did preserve the lives and voices of indigenous people, in one sense, it is also an archive of failure. There is no evidence that the people interviewed in these judicial um, proceedings gained their freedom and purling primarily by enslaved indigenous people continued in the region for at least another generation. I'll just conclude by noting that microfilms were made of these, um, of, of these particular documents um, in the 1960s, and they're now available in precisely two places, one in the Archivo General de Indias in Spain, and the other is the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, and so the, the fact that these things exist and are circulating, but they don't actually, but they're still kind of difficult to access, I think is one of the reasons why um, so few scholars have actually looked at them and tried to understand um, what they might mean um, for scholarship on enslaved indigenous people. Thanks so much, Trevor. Um, our next speaker is Linford Fisher, who is a professor at Brown University um, and is well known for his work in Native uh, American studies uh, in all sorts of ways. Um, perhaps his most important work is the Indian uh, Indian's Great Awakening, although I'm also delighted that he wrote a, a fascinating article uh, on Indian slavery for a book that Sophia White and Sophie White and I uh, published a couple of years ago on Inherence, in hearing enslaved voices. Uh, he's doing a lot of work on uh, Native Americans and slavery, uh, particularly as a principal investigator uh, on a project called St Stolen Relations, uh, Recovering Stories of Indian Enslavement. Uh, his talk today uh, is going to be called Resisting Race Shifting uh, in Indigenous Freedom Suits. So delighted to have you here, Linford, and uh, over to you. Thanks so much, Trevor. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. Thanks for those who have organized and supported this webinar, and also to, um, to Professor Newman for organizing this panel too, and corralling us all uh, to get uh, together in this way via, via webinar. Uh, and thanks, Becky, too, for starting us off with a really excellent presentation. I really appreciate this point regarding presences and absences in the archives and the efforts of Indigenous men and women to assert their own identities. Um, and I think I'll continue some of these themes, but jump ahead 250 years or so to a slightly different context. Uh, but it's amazing how many of these themes remain consistent in different imperial contexts and different geographies as well. Um, so I was struck by that in your paper. So my paper today examines some indigenous freedom suits in the British Caribbean and especially British Honduras or Belize in the early 19th century, so shifting from the late 16th to the early 19th century. Now I want to consider three main issues. First, the ongoing prevalence of indigenous slavery in the 19th century, as uh, Professor Bernard mentioned in his opening, uh, that the field of indigenous slavery has increasingly tried to understand and recognize indigenous slavery uh, intertwining with and alongside of, uh, sort of black Atlantic slavery. But the narrative of indigenous slavery is sort of is that uh, when people recognize it, that it peaks in the early 18th century and then sort of drops off of the literature and the radar in different kinds of ways. And so I think these uh, freedom suits illustrate the ways in which indigenous enslavement persists well into the 19th century in very uh, different kinds of contexts, the Caribbean, uh, parts of uh, Latin America, as well as North, North America as well. So the third thing I want to mention here is that with a third sort of framing of this paper is the importance of these freedom suits in potentially modeling what larger scale emancipation of an entire race, quote unquote, might look like. Uh, that is to say, I want to sort of think with you briefly um, and ask the question about whether these freedom suits somehow influence the larger push for emancipation in 1833 and 1834, if that makes sense. I should say that this paper is drawn from my book manuscript that looks at the enslavement of natives in the wider English Caribbean and the United States between the 16th and 19th centuries. So this is chapter 11, I think it is. So as scholars have noted, the period between the 1770s and the 1820s was a time of increased litigation in the wider English Caribbean, and I think elsewhere too, and the United States between the 16th 
uh, and, and, and 19, uh, excuse me, um, in the British Caribbean and the United States. Um, from Virginia to Jamaica, uh, hundreds if not thousands of enslaved indigenous people petition local magistrates for their freedom. And almost always these petitions rested on a creative use of the age old principle of partis sequitur ventrum, a Latin phrase that roughly meant the slave status of the mother was passed down to the child. So normally this was leveraged by owners or enslavers, largely Euro Americans, to legally claim the descendants of enslaved people in bondage generation after generation. But over time, indigenous litigants turned this logic uh, on its head in a way in their favor and for their service, claiming their freedom if they could demonstrate that they had a once free maternal ancestor, right? So if their maternal ancestor was free, then by that same logic, they should be free. And truthfully, most indigenous enslaved people had a free maternal ancestor if they went back far enough. The challenge was always proving this in court. And Claire, if I could have the next slide, please, the map. So this series of freedom suits I'd like to focus on for a few minutes all took place in British Honduras, now the country of police, between 1819 or so and 1829, 1830. And the history of indigenous enslavement in this region bridged British Honduras, uh, which you can see on the map uh, kind of to the, the right hand side of, um, uh, of what was now Mexico. Uh, and so it bridged British Honduras on the left hand side of the map with the Mosquito Shore, which is that big oval kind of in the bottom center of the map as well. Um, so these freedom suits bridge these two regions um, and uh, the Mosquito Shore, as I'll mention more in a little bit, was really important because it was the site of a long-term Native American slave trade uh, that the English had tapped into and created actually in a way. So the settlement of British Honduras dated back to at least the 18th century when English logwood cutters were, put, were pushed out of the Laguna de Terminos on the Yucatan Peninsula, which is also on the map there. Not officially a colony, British Honduras remained an important site of the logwood and hardwood trade for the water English colonies in the 18th century. Uh, British Honduras received an unexpected demographic boost in 1787 when 3,500 British colonists and their enslaved men, women, and children were evacuated from the Mosquito Shore and by the British government and uh, essentially sent to Belize uh, and the surrounding region uh, after the Mosquito Shore transferred to the Spanish. Uh, so in 1811, the population of British Honduras made it one of the smaller British colonies with an estimated 200 white people, 500 free blacks, natives, and people of color, and approximately 3,000 enslaved people. And crucially, at least several hundred of the enslaved men, women, and children brought by English colonists to British Honduras were enslaved natives who had been held in captivity on the Mosquito Shore. So that's really the connection there. It's important to note that they were not Mosquito Indians themselves, but rather natives from up and down the Central American coast and in the interior, the Mosquito Indians had slave raided and sold to the English over time in the 18th century. So the Mosquito and Zambos Indians of the Mosquito Shore were an important ally of the English in the 17th and 18th centuries. And it's a longer and, and more complicated story that I don't have time to really narrate today. So there were a few freedom suits in British Honduras or Belize in the early 18 teens, um, some of which were successful, most of which were not. But something different erupted in 1819 and 1820, which is what I want to focus on today. Over the course of two years, there were uh, actually in 1819, uh, there were a few high profile cases regarding the brutal mistreatment of enslaved natives that over the course of two years led to dozens upon dozens of petitions of wrongful enslavement by natives in British Honduras. And there's two early cases in 1819 that really kind of set this off. And I won't go into all the details, but uh, they are both brutal cases of mistreatment of enslaved indigenous women. The first is the case of an enslaved woman named Kitty, who was brutally flogged by her mistress, Duncan at Campo. And uh, the depositions bring out the full grisly details of her mistreatment, which I won't repeat here. The second case in 1819 involved Peggy, an enslaved uh, native of a magistrate named Manfield Bowen, who similarly brutalized, whipped, and chained Peggy up over the course of several weeks before being uh, found out and being brought to court to answer for his actions. 
Notably, in both of these cases in 1819, the jury found the, these owners to be not guilty. Uh, they had not broken any laws since they were disciplining their own slaves who were their property, as the court records affirmed. So in light of these two cases of non-prosecution for unacceptable violence against enslaved people, enslaved indigenous people in British Honduras decided on a different tack. They began submitting petitions, not of mistreatment, but rather of wrongful enslavement. In fact, between September and December of 1819, uh, the local magistrate, Arthur, received so many petitions of wrongful enslavement that he wrote to the Attorney General of Jamaica for advice, and the Attorney General wrote back stating his opinion that the various laws of native enslavement in Jamaica in 1741 and the Mosquito Shore in 1775 uh, were intended to outlaw indigenous enslavement altogether. And therefore, uh, that um, this individual in, this, um, in, in British Honduras should take very seriously these claims of, um, of wrongful enslavement and should try to free uh, these individuals. I think the Attorney General of Jamaica had a pretty generous reading of these early laws, actually, from what I understand, having read them very closely, they prohibited additional enslavement, but didn't uh, actually free existing enslaved natives. But that's a different part of the story. So the, the point is by, the 18, by 1820, this is being read very differently. These laws are being read differently. So this advice from the Jamaica Attorney General empowered Superintendent Arthur in January of 1820 to set up a board of commissioners in British Honduras to hear the claims of wrongfully enslaved natives. And crucially, one of the key principles of the board was that the burden of proof should fall on the owners, that natives were presumed to be free unless owners could provide otherwise. So this opened a veritable floodgate of claims of wrongful enslavement with person after person coming before the Board of Commissioners with stories and witnesses. And if we could have the next slide, please, uh, which shows the beginning of several listings of indigenous petitioners found in the archives. So these 100 or so claims of individuals are incredibly rich in terms of family history and detail. Um, some petitioners even submitted family trees that showed their lineage uh, that traced back to Mosquito Shore. Uh, one listing included 22 enslaved co native cousins and relatives who also should be free. Um, and all of these petitioners eventually, in some way, narrate their connection back to Central, to other parts of Central America and to the Mosquito Shore and enslavement uh, through mosquito Indian processes as well. And just to affirm something Professor Getz said as well uh, regarding Catalina and other enslaved natives who testified in court, uh, it must have taken an incredible amount of bravery to show up in what is very, a uh, very small colonial context to articulate uh, and argue for your own freedom. So some cases were straightforward, listing out maternal free ancestors, other cases were more complex. One native petitioner named Marina stated that her great-grandmother named Waneka had been enslaved through the Mosquito Coast Indians trade and had been sent to Jamaica, which was really common. There she gave birth to several generations of natives who were also enslaved. This included Marina's grandmother, Mimba, and Marina's own mother, Samantee. Both Mimba and Samantee were sent from Jamaica back to Mosquito Shore by Captain Stoddard who appears to have been their owner slash enslaver. So Samantee gave birth to Marina, who was then carried to British Honduras in 1787. But Marina's sister, Betsy, and I know there's a lot of names here. I, I don't pretend that you're following me exactly because I can't keep them all straight, but it's interesting because Marina's sister, Betsy, was left behind in Jamaica under the assumption that no one would know she was actually an Indian. And indeed, a recent uh, traveler to Spanish town, Jamaica, confirmed that Betsy was still living as a slave of a family behind the church in that town, which also confirms that there are indigenous people in Jamaica in 1820 who are still enslaved. So one of the most fascinating aspects of, of these dozens of dozens of cases is that these enslaved natives were repeatedly called Negroes in the records by their enslavers. There are a number of ways to interpret this, of course. Uh, the first is that masters and mistresses tried to racially recategorize these individuals as Negro to uh, undercut their claims to freedom. And this seems like the most obvious and logical explanation 
Um, and, you know, such racial shifting uh, is incredibly, was incredibly common all throughout the Atlantic from the earliest period of colonization through the official end of slavery in the 19th century. There's so many examples and instances of this in court records, runaway or self-emancipated slave ads, ship manifests, plenty of censuses, etc., where indigenous people were called black or Negro or mulatto, anything but Indian, in an effort to justify their ongoing enslavement. The other possibility is that some of these indigenous petitioners had black or mixed race mothers or fathers and therefore had darker skin. And this too was really common by the 19th century, and at least in the United States, there were several court cases that tied enslavability to the darkness of one's skin. But even if they were, uh, even if some of these enslaved natives were multi-race, it's important to note that they were still indigenous and still had a claim to freedom, which is certainly how the court saw things. And what I find brilliant here is that these enslaved natives knew who they were. They knew their family histories, like the ones that Professor Getz had mentioned too. Even their racism and settler colonialism tried to suppress it and even erase it. And these indigenous people forcefully made their case in court, bringing testimony and evidence that was irrefutable. And not all indigenous people who are racially reclassified found a way to protest it, of course, uh, as, as I think the sort of silences in the archives tell us. Um, but this instance is especially inspiring because it involves so many people who resisted racial erasure so uh, successfully. So in British Honduras then, uh, these indigenous freedom suits prompted a backlash in several different ways. Owners began, to, or enslavers began to crack down, punish their enslaved people. The planters in British Honduras uh, published a scathing critique of Arthur in 1824, and there was a counter publication as well. What's interesting though, in the publications and the defense of their enslavement of natives that these planters published and, and articulate, is that they argue at one point that it was illogical to free one race of slaves and keep another one in bondage, which I think is really fascinating and telling. Um, behind their protests was a fear, it seems, that freeing natives would likely lead to the eventual freeing of enslaved Africans. So just to wrap up this part of the story, it took time for things to get sorted out. In 1826, the Commissioner for Legal Inquiry arrived and they actually made a determination in favor of indigenous people. It took a while for this to be sorted out, but in 1830, these natives were finally freed, notably after their owners were compensated for their losses by the Crown. So I wanna just conclude, I know a bit of our time here, I apologize, conclude by thinking through the implications of these cases. Why are they important? Um, well, first of all, I think they are an incredible demonstration of mass indigenous legal activism, campaigning for freedom in the face of brutal mistreatment in a system that was tilted against them. Um, and I think this is representative of a much longer process that both indigenous and black people use in the law to secure their freedom over time, in many other colonies and imperial contexts over time. Second, though, these cases reveal yet another instance of an attempted racial shifting at the hands of enslavers and masters, but also a stunning example of, indi of indigenous people asserting their identity nonetheless. Third, and this is just something I'm still thinking through, I'm increasingly thinking that this decade-long attempt to free several hundred enslaved natives served as a sort of test case for general emancipation in the British Empire starting in 1834, or 1838 after a period of indenture in most colonies. The compensation, the involvement of the crown, the proclamation by fiat of a ruling authority, this was all replicated at a much larger scale in 1834 and fairly successfully. So is it possible that the British crown of magistrates and even planters looked at this high profile case of native emancipation and said, yes, I think this could work. I'd like to think that this planted the seed that grew into a general emancipation in 1834, but I'm still thinking through that. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Linford. That was 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 fascinating, particularly um, particularly ending on a very uh, provocative thought as well, which is very is very good. Um, our next speaker is uh, Sandy Brewster Brewster Walker, um, and I don't think Sandy's able to use her her uh, her uh, um, her camera, but we can see we can see um, her uh, under, un, un, in the slide below. Um, Sandy is from uh, is a descendant of the uh, Montecat Indians, uh, and she's now the executive director and government affairs officer uh, for the um, for the Montecat Indian Nation. 
Um, she, we're moving now from the Caribbean to Long Island. Uh, Sandy has been has worked in a variety of ways and as as a prolific writer, uh, both in nonfiction but also in poetry and fiction. Uh, she's been working recently um, on a very important project, which she'll talk about today, which is North Fork People of Colour, uh, 1641-1827, uh, about people from the east end of Long Island. Uh, so what uh, Sandy is going to be talking about us talking about today is unfree labour of Indigenous children on Long Island. So thanks very much, Sandy. Over to you. And thank you. Um, it's I actually, as I was putting the slides together, I kind of tweaked the title, Unfree Labour of Indigenous People, Including Children of Colour, because of just what Linford was talking about, how some people's race were changed. Um, and I'll kind of tell you a little bit more about that as we go along. Next slide. Now, this slide is only in the um, slide package because I wanted to show you how young slave children were. None of these children are from Long Island, though. But um, at least some of them look like they could be eight years old. Next slide. Now, Long Island, you, most people don't know where it is, but New York City, if you cross the bridge and go over to Brooklyn, you're on Long Island. And I'm going to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, Long Island, the east end of Long Island. I have done about 22,000 genealogies, but I'm going to concentrate just on Suffolk County and the North Fork. But in every township, I've started a program where we're actually indexing all of the people of color starting at first contact which was 1640. Now the North Fork that I'm going to talk about if you see Long Island is shaped like a fish you see the top fin in the back that's the North Fork. The one on the bottom is the South Fork <clears throat> and that's where today uh, most of the celebrities and stuff live or go to vacation. And in between, that little island in between is Shelter Island. Next slide. The North Fork uh, People of Color Project takes you from 1641 to 1827. And 1827 is when New York State um, abolished slavery. And actually, we go back I don't know why I'm lost. We go back um, a little further than 1641, but 1641 is when um, the settlers crossed over from Connecticut, New London, and came into Oyster Pond. And our project is a digital project. We're putting together um, a database to humanize the enslaved, the indentured, the free, the freed and the free people that became the first workforce on Long Island on the East End. And it's in a, right now it's in a spreadsheet and a relational database. Next slide. And when I say we, there's five of us in the project. There's um, Amy Folks, who's the historian for Southhold. I'm, I'd have a period 1687 to 1733. Jackie, who's a historian, Richard Wines, who's a historian, and Steve Wick. And we each took a different period in history. And right now, we're actually tracing and tracking 1,419 people of color. Next slide. As I mentioned, it's the enslaved, the indentured, and the free, and the freed and the free people of color. Next slide. And this is one of the spreadsheets, and um, it shows you some of the fields. I'm sorry I couldn't get it to go any larger where you could really see it, but eventually it'll be up online, or some of it will be part of Linford's database. Next slide. But we've connected a lot of the families, and you can see a lot of the children that were slaves. And if you notice, I mentioned that island between the North Fork and the South Fork was Shelter Island. That's the island that had mostly the most slaves. 
and they were from Barbados. The North Fork and the South Fork, the people that were enslaved early on, were mostly Native Americans. Next slide. Uh, you can go to the next slide. The unfree free labor force on Long Island, uh, most people didn't have more than six to eight slaves. And most of them were indigenous in the 1600s and the 1700s. And they were small farms. They took care of the animals, the horses, uh, regular farm chores. They were domestic servants. Um, they were taking care of cooking, cleaning, child rearing. Um, the big thing was fishing in the grits mills. But they would enslave children as young as five years old. Next slide. I'm going to take you on a journey of an eight year old. And um, she is identified as Sarah, and she was indigenous, and her mother is Dorcas. And they were both born free, but we haven't been able to determine when they um, became slaves. But Sarah was sold in 16, 1689 to James Pearsall in, South, in the town of South Hold. And she was sold as his, to him as his property for life. Next slide. And this is, um, I couldn't find the original document in my stuff, but this is the document, the bill of sale for Sarah. And it was typical, you could find quite a few of these as you're researching through the different people in our database. Next slide. But what makes Sarah a little different she was sold, you'll see, five different times. She was sold at eight years old. And this is in um, Mattituck. Just before you go out on the North Fork, the first town, around the first town you get to, I think it's actually the second, is Mattituck. And um, this is a cemetery where there is a couple of slaves in it. But it's also, this is where James is buried. Next slide. And he kept her until 1698. And then he sold her. And he sold her to someone in the town of Southampton. And this is kind of going down to the, uh, the bottom fin. He sold her to John Parker for 16 pounds. And that's not his grits mill. That's just one that exists today that's still down in Southampton amongst the mansions there. Next slide. A third owner was in 1710 and Wicks or Weeks of Bridgehampton. This is right next to Southampton. But he actually uh, was a keeper of a tavern, which was in New York, and that's Bull's Head Tavern. I think it's down near Wall Street. And he's believed to be a slave dealer. Wicks, uh, also on his property on Long Island, he buried for, at one time for John Parker, he buried two um, Indians or Native Americans. And he also owned a burial ground for a slave, for his slaves. Next slide. Her fourth owner um, took possession of her in 1710. And he only kept her a few months. He was a captain, Robert Walters. And she's gone now from um, out in the Hamptons all the way into New York. And when you're in the Hamptons, the east end of Long Island, you really identify with Connecticut, and Rhode Island. But they've taken her now into New York with her fourth owner. Next slide. After a couple of months, the same year, she was sold again to Captain Peter uh, Rowland. And she was just 21 years old when she was sold. And at this time, um, we kind of believe that she was being sold or trafficked. Um, it was sex trafficking. 
um, because of her age. And when they sold her, he took her on the boat and he took her to Madeira. Next slide. And the, the ship that she went on was the Fortune. And this is the same Fortune that in 1621 came over to Plymouth. Next slide. When he got there, um, he was ordered by the English um, to actually return her back to the colony. One of She had become friends with someone on the ship and they helped to get to the consul's office. And uh, there's a series of letters. I was going to copy them and put them in the slide, but it would have made it too long presentation. But there's a series of letters that went back and forth that talk about her journey. And uh, they told her that they would give her her freedom, but she'd have to convert to Catholic. And what she declined to do. Next slide. And this is her petition. She gets back into New York. She comes back to New York. And someone helps her petition the governor, uh, the colonial governor, Robert Hunter. And this is the following year. Now, the state uh, is looking for the papers. Um, well, when I say the state, the state archives is looking for the papers because we don't know what their decision was. Uh, but we do know that um, she took a last name, Sarah uh, Robbins, and it's spelled both ways with um, one B and with two Bs. And she kind of disappears. Next slide. Let's see, I think I mentioned this stuff. You can go to the next slide. While that was going on in other parts of Long Island, uh, slave children could be abandoned. And the only thing we can figure out is someone would actually take them when after they were born, if, they, if the slave owner didn't want the child, they would actually take them and abandon the baby and the baby would die. Next slide. Now we're going to jump from the east end of Long Island closer to the county line, which is right at the belly of the fish. If you think of a fit, Long Island is like a fish. The county line is right at the belly. And we're on the, um, the north side of that, which is the Long Island Sound, Sound facing Connecticut. Um, in the town of Huntington, they actually have a list which I found of people that were abandoning the slaves babies and some of them are Native Americans because what we found out too was that if they mention a person was a slave and you um, they didn't mention black or Negro they were probably Native American and when we attract them we find out they really were. So you see a number of uh, people on this list besides um, Negroes and Blacks that, are, that were abandoned or left to die. So, cause, and the other thing is people look at slavery and they think of the South and they think of how cruel it was there. But it was also could be very cruel in New England and on Long Island in New York. Um, the slave masters could also hire a whipper on Long Island and they'd pay them to um, whip their slaves. They didn't want to get their own hands dirty, I guess, but they'd pay them to whip their slaves, whether they were Indian black or um, Negro. The other thing I want to mention, which I was shaking my head and agreeing with Linford when he was talking, I've found people that had slaves and when it became illegal to hold an Indian as slave in the 1700s, they did not get rid of the slave that was Indian. They changed the slave's race 
or they just wouldn't indicate the race of the, the slave. And then you also find a lot of historians in the 1800s, um, when you look at their work, what they did was they saw the word slave and they changed it to black. But when you go back to the actual records, the person wasn't black. Next slide. This is um, just another slave paper. And there are a lot of these on Long Island because once they, um, with the gradual abolition of slavery passed, people started to um, man manumit to free their slaves. And this is just one of the, I've collected hundreds of them myself. Next slide. And on the South Fork, remember that's the bottom fin where today all the entertainers live in their big summer homes. Um, we have Stephen Hand in 1693, and he gives his Indian boy to his eldest son. And you also see a lot of this when you go through the wills, you go through, um, you find some of them tucked in with the land records because most of the people, there was no slave pen, there was no slave um, auction block on Long Island, especially in this um, Suffolk County East End area. People were buying one or two slaves and they were mainly buying them from New London or from a ship that would come in. And then you had, of course, uh, Sylvester who has the own the island in between the North and the South Fork, he was bringing up slaves from um, Barbados. Next slide. This I put in, uh, it's just some, one of the slave burial grounds that's out in Orion in the town of South Hold. And we're actually um, checking on each one of these people and connecting them. They're part of our database too. Next slide. And I want to thank you. Oh, but before I go, if you look at my bag that's on my shoulder, that's my mother's mother who was Montaukett Indian. And on the other side, the left side in the lower corner, that's my father's father who was also a Montaukett Indian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandy. That was, that was fascinating and um, sobering and uh, a bit horrifying at, at certain times. So thank you very much for that, uh, for that very interesting presentation. Uh, our final presenter is uh, Professor Brooke Newman, who's a professor at Virginia Commonwealth University um, and well known to us here at the Wilberforce Institute. Um, she's worked on Caribbean history in particular with her award winning book, uh, on dark inheritance, uh, blood, sex, and race. Well, here we are, blood, sex, and race. It's it's it on in um, in colonial Jamaica. Um, she's working now on. Uh, she also has worked on native diasporas, uh, indigenous identities, and settler colonization in the Americas, um, and uh, is is involved uh, in, in a variety of things to do with uh, indigenous indigenous Americans, uh, particularly in the Caribbean. Um, and she's going to be talking today uh, on My Mother Was an Indian, Gender, Slavery and Kinship uh, in the British Caribbean. So welcome, Brooke. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for being here. And Sandy, that was really fascinating and, and honestly hard to follow after all those amazing and rich details. So the case I will be discussing today is happening around the same time as um, the case in Honduras that Linford discussed. However, it has a very different outcome. And I believe this has a lot to do with local politics and also with uh, geopolitical concerns and also with the scope of um, the different situations happening in Honduras and in the island of Tobago that I'll be talking about um, right now. So this is going to be a brief um, kind of snippet of a much richer and more detailed case study, um, but bear with me here. <clears throat> 
So in February 1824, the Crown's Commissioners of Legal Inquiry for the British Caribbean submitted a report to the Colonial Office explaining their decision respecting the case of an enslaved woman in Tobago named Polly, called, quote, Polly Indian and her children. Registered as the property of Elphinstone Pidget, Chief Justice of the Tobago Court of Common Pleas, though technically owned by his wife, Deborah, who was formerly Deborah Thornhill from Barbados, Polly had claimed freedom for herself and her three daughters in 1822 on the basis of Indian maternal ancestry. According to her testimony, her mother, Sophie, had worked as an enslaved domestic for the Thornhill family in Barbados, and while she worked for them, she bore three children, Phyllis, Chamont, and Polly, all of whom were treated as slaves, though, quote, everyone who saw Sophie knew she was an Indian and not an African. And these are Polly's words. And I just want to pause here for a second to say that what I really find fascinating about this case and how I think it connects to um, the other panelists' work is the issue of how to grapple with a case like this when someone comes forward, they're making claims to Indigenous identity, and yet they have no sense of kinship uh, networks, no sense of community, no specifics. It's very general in terms of the claim that they are making. And um, as such, it is assessed in a very general way. So in 1779, when Polly was 10 years old, this is her story that she tells, uh, the provost marshal seized her from the heavily indebted Thornhills and sold Polly at a public auction to repay a creditor. Mary Clark, Deborah Thornhill's widowed mother, purchased Polly on behalf of the family and rented her out to other plantations. In 1780, following the great hurricane that devastated Barbados, killing Mary Clark and further indebting the family, the Thornhills sold Polly's mother and her two siblings to a planter who then brought them to Tobago um, to labor on a sugar estate. In the mid 1780s, Sophie absconded from her master's premises. She traveled all the way to the capital of Scarborough to complain to the governor of French Tobago of mistreatments at the hand of her British enslaver. The governor, who in the record said he was struck by her appearance, freed Sophie, quote, as an Indian and her two children, saying that they were wrongfully enslaved. However, Polly, meanwhile, remained enslaved in Barbados, unaware that her mother and her siblings had escaped bondage. Actually, she had no idea what had happened to them. Many years later, in 1799, Polly and her children, she now had several children of her own, relocated to Tobago when she was gifted to the 20-year-old Miss Deborah Thornhill upon her marriage to um, the island's chief justice. There, Polly learned that her mother had died a free woman and was seen as a reputed Indian, and that her sister and brother had already left the island, severing ties with their enslaved past. So she's arriving on this island, discovering that all of her relatives have been freed and they are either dead or gone. She comes forward years later to claim that she and her children should be free, but her tenuous claim to freedom rested on a maternal connection to a long deceased freed woman who from the British commissioner's perspective may have been neither her mother nor of Indian descent. So there's multiple things in question here. In 1823, the Crown's commissioners arrived in Tobago bearing instructions from Earl Bathurst and the Crown to investigate, quote, whether Polly Indian and her issue are or are not slaves. The case of Polly Indian was one of many municipal level examinations conducted by the commissioners of legal inquiry during their comprehensive tour of the British Caribbean during the 1820s. As Lauren Benton and Lisa Ford have argued, the commissioner's tour, quote, belonged to a larger project of constitutional intervention. And this intervention was dev devised to bring order and the king's impartial justice to an empire characterized by widespread legal diversity. Also, due to the number of claims and petitions that were put forward by enslaved and free people of color, as well as um, enslaved people of native ancestry, they are essentially inviting um, intervention from the central authorities. And this is a way to enhance central authority as well. 
The unlawful enslavement of Indians was a reoccurring theme that the commissioners were met with during their investigations. But in the absence of legal documentation to prove Indian descent, individual assertions of native lineage centered on reputed maternal ties, physical appearance, and conformity to really vague Indian characteristics, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit, focused on the largely unverifiable claims of a single enslaved woman who was owned by a respected colonial official. Polly's case was never published in Britain. It generated local interest in Tobago, but really was lost at the time. Nobody really heard about this case. Yet her freedom claim offers insight into the contested nature and meanings of Indian identity during an era of British imperial interventions into the Atlantic slave system. Although Polly claimed freedom on behalf of herself and her children um, in Tobago and not until 1822, and this is before the governor and council, and then it was referred to the commissioners in 1824, the evidentiary basis for her original appeal um, was due to kinship ties that she claimed were forged in Barbados. As the surviving record demonstrates, Polly understood that her legal status and that of her descendants hinged on knowledge and evidence of uh, parentage, but specifically maternal lineage in Barbados and throughout the Caribbean, British Caribbean, as Linford has already mentioned, the principle of partis sequitur ventrum had long prevailed in assigning slave status. And this is both in custom and in law. Although colonial legislators throughout the British Caribbean had consigned the offspring of women of African, Indian, and multiple ancestries to hereditary slavery since the 17th century, Demonstrating Indian extraction on the mother's side offered sufficient grounds for an enslaved person to challenge their legal status in the late 18th and 19th centuries. Yet the indigenous heritage of thousands of people of native ancestry who remained enslaved in this region was often obscured, as we've been discussing, as a result of inter-ethnic mixture with Africans and Europeans over multiple generations, but also and crucially because of colonial slave laws including Tobago's slave code of 1775, which was renewed in 1794, which strategically hid native slavery by referring vaguely to quote, Negroes and other slaves. And what I've discovered from you know, researching this, um, as some have mentioned before, is that many um, slaves were listed as either other slave or mulatto um, as a way of obscuring their identity. In custom, if not law, Indians were categorized as racially distinct from Africans, entitled to freedom and the protection of the British crown. But the burden of proof could rest on the enslaved, especially in cases where it's an one individual rather than a large group, um, as in Honduras. In lieu of documentary evidence proving Indian descent to which enslaved individuals rarely had access, challenging one's legal status on the basis of native maternal ancestry demanded at minimum two forms of evidence. First, the testimony of free persons who are willing to swear under oath to the existence of kinship ties between the enslaved person and an Indian mother. Um, and they had to swear this under oath and agree that they believed you know, definitively that this was true. And second, that the body of an enslaved individual exhibited physical evidence so-called physical evidence of Indian heritage. From a legal standpoint though, both could prove deceptive. The former relied on potentially fallible oral sources and memory, and this is particularly from the British perspective um, in their Eurocentric worldview about what constitutes evidence, valid evidence. Um, and the latter depended on subjective assessments of physical appearance and British notions of what an Indian was, what an Indian looked like. For the commissioners, the case of Polly Indian turned on establishing proof of native maternal lineage in accordance with what they referred to as the strict rules of law. Dispensing the Crown's impartial justice demanded verifiable facts, not hearsay, they insisted. And this is really this was in the report that they submitted to the Crown. Simply resembling an Indian or having rumors of Indian ancestry was insufficient. If Polly or any enslaved claimant was born, quote, of an African mother, a slave, though by an Indian father, partis sequitur ventrum, the rule of maternal inheritance proved determinative. 
To assess the validity of Polly's claim, the commissioner sought answers to three questions, and they um, brought in about 14 different witnesses and asked them all of these questions. First, whether Polly has the appearance of an Indian. Second, whether she was in fact the daughter of Sophie. And third, whether Sophie was free because she was actually an Indian or on some other account. They began by questioning her master, who had acquired a reputation in Tobago um, as an honorable and learned justice. So he was one of the few um, administrators in the British Caribbean who wasn't seen as being um, like some kind of despot at the time. He claimed that Polly was lawfully enslaved and that she had fabricated her whole claim to native ancestry and that actually his wife's family could trace her ancestry back and there was no evidence of, of this being true. The commissioners then summoned Polly and asked her about her childhood, her family and her treatment at the hands of her master. And he continued to watch the proceedings. So they are grilling her while he is in the room observing this whole um, ordeal. As for the grounds on which she claimed her freedom, Polly said, quote, my claim is that I know my mother was an Indian and that I and my children should be free. Her own Indian heritage was common knowledge, she explained. I was called Polly Indian ever since I was born, but I was always treated as a slave. And when the commissioners paused and said, but how do you know for sure that your mother, Sophie, was an Indian, if in fact she was your mother, and she claimed, well, it was obvious. Um, Indians and Africans look completely different. That was her quote. Polly reiterate, reiterated that she and her surviving three adult daughters, Sophie, Maria, and Harriet, who between them had seven children of their own, all of whom were owned now um, by her master, were literally descended from an Indian woman and deserved their freedom accordingly. So she is really pushing back um, against what her master is saying. The commissioners then bring in uh, four members of the free colored community who agreed that Polly's alleged mother went by the name of Indian Sophie. And one witness said, I don't know that she was an Indian and I could not say from her appearance whether or not she was. She had straight hair like mine, but I'm not an Indian. And when the commissioners pushed against them and said, well, in 1822, during the local examination, you claim that she was an Indian and that her mother probably was an Indian. They said, well, you know, I don't want to sign an oath now positively claiming that that's true. So a lot of them backpedaled um, two years later when faced with the scrutiny of these imperial commissioners. Those questions refused, those who were questioned by the commissioners refused to swear that Sophie was Polly's mother or that Sophie was of Indian descent only that she was said to be the mother of Polly and that she was called an Indian woman. Nobody really knew much about their background and they certainly weren't willing to put their own reputations um, and legal status on the line for this case. For the remainder of the examinations, the commissioners focused their attention on pinning down the supposed racial characteristics shared by all Indians, subjecting Polly to an intimate public examination they posed the following questions to a range of five uh, white men who came in to discuss whether or not she was an Indian. They asked questions to them such as, have you seen many Indians in your life? Is Polly like an Indian? What are the distinguishing marks of an Indian? From your knowledge of Indians, should you pronounce Polly to be of Indian extraction? All of these men scrutinized Polly's physical appearance while her master observed the proceedings. So this is a very personal um, inspection of her body in front of a number of men. But the visual examination failed to clarify Polly's heritage, however. And I just wanna give one example of what someone said in this examination. An elderly man named James um, Denoon was asked if Polly resembled an Indian. And he said, I should not hesitate for a moment to say so. But then the commissioner said, well, we urge you to look again, think more. Does she really look like an Indian to you? Inspect her hair, inspect her stature, inspect her skin tone. Does she look like she has the signs of quote, Indianness? So he looks again and he says, quote, well, her hair curls a little, it's not quite straight. It's black, but it's not exactly like an Indian's. And then the commissioners pressed him and said, do you know any person here who from having seen Indians is capable of saying 
definitively whether or not a person is or is not of Indian extraction. And Danun confessed, I do not. And so at the end of this examination, essentially the commissioners were in a, in a bit of a um, kerfuffle about the fact that no one really knew what a supposed Indian characteristics uh, should be. And there's a really rich description of this about like all of these possibilities and that, that nobody can really agree on not only what they are in some kind of racial essentialist sense, but also if Polly in fact, or her mother um, actually had these characteristics. Consequently, Polly's claim to native maternal lineage failed to withstand the commissioner's close scrutiny. We find, they reported, deciding according to the strict rules of law with the exclusion of hearsay evidence that the said Polly and her issues are slaves. The inability of the witnesses to positively determine if Polly was Sophie's daughter or if Sophie was an Indian complicated the commissioner's task of determining whether Polly herself resembled an Indian. And they expressed frustration about um, the slipperiness of race, particularly what what it meant to be Indian in a moment when people were, were claiming freedom on the basis of this native ancestry, but only in very general sense and a very general sense. And they wrote, it was found extremely difficult amid the most inconsistent accounts to ascertain what the characteristics of Indians were. But as far as we could be, as far as we could tell, she did not have them. Her complexion is that of a mulatto. The Indian is a deep copper color. Their hair is said to be long and straight and lank and coal black, but hers is short and frizzy and dark, but not black. Surviving records indicate that Polly remained enslaved until her sudden death um, of a fit, that's what it says in the records, on April 8th, 1826, and she's actually listed as a mulatto. If the records of her contested legal case, the manuscript records had not survived, Polly's claim to indigenous identity, Polly's assertion of her kinship ties would have remained obscured as her master had intended. Erasing Polly's self-proclaimed native identity and kinship connections enabled this family to exercise control over her labor and the labor of her children and grandchildren for the entirety of uh, their lives. In the absence of genealogical records or witnesses willing to swear positively that an enslaved person was an Indian or the child or descendant of an Indian mother who was free, convincing local or even imperial authorities of unambiguous native origin required a claimant's body to conform to long held, long held, um, you know, confused British assumptions about the supposed distinguishing features of Indians. And the result was the historical marginalization and silencing um, of enslaved individuals such as Polly, who failed to produce any kind of evidence, but also who failed to fit within homogenizing imperialist racial constructions of so-called Indian identity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brooke. Uh, for a fantastic, uh, fantastic talk, and um, now we've we've got some time to open up to questions. Do we have any questions that uh, people would like to to to, to, to give? Uh, the first one is for, from Judith uh, for Judith Bixley, Bixley for Linford. Uh, if the law preventing Indian enslavement uh, existed before the early nineteenth century, uh, why do you think cases focused on mistreatment? at first rather than wrongful enslavement. Thanks, so uh, interesting question. The question I think though um, of whether or not indigenous enslavement was, was technically wrong, I think is, is um, part of this, this difficulty, right? So um, there was technically back in 1775, so far as I know, the first instance of the Crown getting involved in a case of indigenous enslavement in which a proclamation is made uh, by King George III, or at least his ministers, um, right as the American Revolution is heating up, um, prompted by uh, an indigenous slavery case from the Mosquito Shore that results in a proclamation regarding indigenous slavery. I, th I think that's one of the first times, if not the first time that the, the British crown says anything empire-wide 
about indigenous slavery, but it's still a little bit vague. Um, and it's just, it, it is uh, a situation that's more localized. So it's more colony by colony for the most part within the British empire. Um, and so it's really hard actually to point to um, a law that, uh, upon which you could base um, your, your freedom as, as uh, Brooke was saying that there's this sort of legal practice in certain colonies, but also a custom of if you have a free maternal ancestor that you would be, uh, you know, have a claim to freedom, but it's it's not as regularized uh, nor as clear as we might think. So, um, and it's also very locally dependent and, and you need a sympathetic magistrate or a court to hear your claims and to have a sufficient flexibility as this book was saying too, you know, if you really want to, uh, prevent a case from moving forward, there's lots of ways to do that because this is all a little bit of, um, involves testimony and oral tradition and family stories and hearsay is, is actually a category that, that gets used legally in the United States. Um, anyway, so I think that's one part of this, that it's not clear what law to point to to claim your freedom, right? The other point is that I think it's another strategy that indigenous people and other enslaved people use repeatedly, which is to um, have a backdoor way into provoking a freedom suit, which is to say, instead of taking your petition and you know marching out of the house where you're enslaved and going to the judge and saying, I should be free, you run away or you petition regarding abuse or something else, right? And then this opens up an inquiry by local courts that might lead to some sort of action, if that makes sense. Uh, but really fantastic question and uh, appreciate it. Um, just, just to remind people that if you would uh, like to ask a question, if you could put it in the chat session uh, or, um, or, send, or, 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 or send a note directly that you want to ask it um, directly would be, would be very good. Um, I have a question from Sam North, I guess the panelists in general. Um, he asked that many panelists have used both the phrase indigenous and native. Uh, for the Europeans listening, is native still a term being used by North American scholars? Um, is it the appropriate term? Uh, what, what term should, should we use? Mm. Anyone want to venture a comment on that? Brooke, Rebecca, Linford, Sandy? Sandy might be the first person to start that conversation, maybe. Uh, I'd be curious to know, Sandy, what your sense well, is. Uh, well, we use both Indigenous and Native American. It depends on the situation. But okay. I know on Long Island, the tribal nations here use both. Mm -hmm. so, so my sense is that, that now in, in the United States, we don't generally use the term Indian. Um, except as a legal designation, because the word does have legal meaning in United States law. Um, for the people that I work on, the Spanish are always saying India or India um, to describe people, but it's also a kind of, it's it's a way of, of, of removing an ethnonym and um, a sense of political community and of kinship. Um, and so I, I tend to avoid that term um, unless it's a direct quote from a document. Um, in terms of native with a capital N or indigenous with a capital I, um, I think scholars use both at the moment um, to describe indigenous people generally. Um, but I am hearing um, from more and more native scholars that Native American is kind of falling out of use because it emphasizes the American part, which is a European construction um, in and of itself. Um, and so these things are, are, are complicated and, and generally I just try to listen to what um, indigenous scholars are doing and saying um, and, and how, they're, how they are thinking about these issues in terms of, 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 of what I choose to do. In my first book. Oh, we've, we've lost you, Rebecca. Sorry, we lost you there. Any other, any other thoughts? Uh, perhaps we could just move on to a couple of questions for Sandy. The first comes from Simon Clark. Um, regarding the Long Island project, uh, Simon asks, uh, and Simon's a master's student at York St. John University, uh, how is the digital data being collected and what challenges are you finding? Which came out in 2012, oh, which is 10 years ago. Of course, I said Indian all the time. 
about it? Oh, there are a lot of challenges. Um, it's low, especially since we started the project right as the pandemic started. So um, there are a lot of challenges getting access to a lot of primary documents. And um, so that's, the, what was the second part of the question? <coughs> uh, the second part, part was, where is it? What, what, how's the digital data being collated? What challenges uh, do you find? I guess, how uh, how's it being collated? The first part, I think. Was the, um, was. Well, we're collecting it and digitizing the documents if they're not already digitized and like I said we're putting it on a um, the spreadsheet into a database because that can be put in any database like the stolen um, one that um, Linford has it can go be uploaded okay, thanks. there's another question for you Sandy from Margaret Holloway um, where were the enslaved buried was this typically outside the parish graveyard um, back in the 16 and 1700, most slaves were buried on the property where they, if they died on a property where they worked, they were buried there. And if they were Native American, we had a number of um, Native American cemeteries and burial sites around. If they had been freed or they were near one of them, they were buried there. Right, thanks, Sandy. Um, a question for the panel in general. Um, this is from Mike Turner. Um, he says, he asks that the panel have all mentioned the mobility of enslaved indigenous people. Were this group of enslaved people more likely to be trafficked elsewhere than other enslaved people? Or is it the nature of the archive only details those traffic, traffic beyond their place of domicile? So I, I guess particularly for people like Rebecca and Linford who are talking about the archive, um, does it predetermine our, our, our results? Um, or, or, or were, were mobile and enslaved indigenous people more likely to be trafficked and enslaved than other people? So perhaps Linford, Linford first and then Rebecca? Sure. Sure, yeah, really terrific question. Um, I'm not sure I'm willing to say if they were more or less. It seems actually that there's a lot of forced mobility. Uh, within the larger enslavements uh, of, of, of people, Black and, and Indigenous uh, in the Atlantic world. Um, when people end up moving or, or whatever else, they take their enslaved people with them often. Uh, they buy and sell and, and into other parts of the Atlantic, and that's just sort of what, what is mandated and, and um, against people's will, uh, enslaved people's will. I do think there are some instances where the forced migration or transshipment of indigenous people um, does feel somewhat unique uh, in, in situations where there's a benefit to transshipping someone else or taking someone into a different context and then claiming a different status for them, perhaps. If there's sort of an indenture situation, for example, in one colony, you move them to another colony and claim them as, as uh, a slave for life. That's one instance. Um, I, in the case of the Mosquito Shore, it's, it's uh, less intentional and more circumstantial. There's a mass migration that the British government pays for from one area to another. Um, and so it's, it's almost incidental. Um, but I think that by removing them from that area, it the planters' minds cemented their enslavement. And what's really amazing about this story is that the, the memory and the deep recall and the family histories persist and becomes the basis for their freedom. But, Becky? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would also hesitate to say that it more likely or less likely. Um, but certainly a lot of the people that I encounter in the archive have moved sometimes many times in their lives. So the community that I opened with on the Ta and Panama's Pacific coast, um, there were local indigenous people enslaved there um, who identified themselves as Perón Um, There was um, people from, you know, from all over the southern coast of the Caribbean, um, but there were also people identified as Lucayos. Um, so they had come from what we now call the Bahamas. Um, and some of these people actually claimed that they had been illegally moved. So not that they weren't enslaved, but they weren't supposed to be moved far from natal communities. Um, and so that actually enters the archive as a moment in which making a claim of having been moved illegally was a way to try to force a, a, an issue of, of, of freedom. Um, 
But in the first half of the 16th century, you've got Spanish people moving all over the Caribbean looking for new pearl beds, um, for example, um, and they move their enslaved people with them. And, and that forced mobility um, was, I think, pretty common um, in that period. But I think Brooke could say the same, right? <laughs> um, Barbados and Tobago and the back and forth that's happening there. Mm. Um, can I just, I wanted to say something about the first question that was actually directed to Linford about um, mistreatment. And what I found in researching this case, which I thought was really fascinating, is that um, part of the reason why this case was, com was complex was that the original uh, mother, Sophie, who was allegedly the mother, she was freed during the French occupation. And she was freed because she claimed that she had been mistreated at the hands of her British master. And so there was some um, anger at, you know, years later about how this was, was arbitrary. And this was actually, the commissioners called it, it that um, could be both arbitrary, but even sliding into tyrannical in the sense of intervening um, in, in the property of a British subject. And so there, so this connects um, the geopolitics to these questions of indigeneity and who who can claim freedom because it's not even just about uh, you know who can demonstrate that they're connected in some way to someone who was once free it's what is the broader context how did your ancestor become enslaved is there a paper trail how were they freed how can you claim that you really are connected to them is there some um, basis for this the honduras case i think is so fascinating which i've also looked at that too because they have this memory as you were mentioning linford it's it's detailed it's rich there's a large group of people who have enabled um through conversations and oral oral testimony and everything, traditions, they've kept this alive. Whereas when you find individuals in the archive that have fallen through the cracks, they, they have some sense, but they don't know really what it means to be part of a, an indigenous community. And so that to me is, is troubling trying to, to write about them because it puts me in the position of, I want to respect their stories and I want to actually tell the story from their perspective, but there's so little information about them that it, I'm kind of at a loss. And that's actually one of the reasons why I wanted us to all have this conversation is what do you do with um, some of these accounts when you're not sure where the paper trail should go? And if there isn't a paper trail, how do you respectfully engage with the, these claims? Right, thanks, Brooke. Um, a question for Rebecca from Nick Evans. Um, could she, he'd, he'd like you to ask to discuss a little bit more of the pearl fishery uh, that you talk about. Uh, who did the indigenous trade with? Uh, who were the middlemen? Were they Spaniards or was it or were other people? Um, so it starts out that way um, as kind of a, a middleman situation where the Spanish would come seasonally to the Southern Caribbean um, and trade um, metal tools for pearls that had been harvested by indigenous people during the course of a year. Um, and then the Spanish realized they can make much, much more money if they set up permanent encampments, essentially, and bring in enslaved divers to do the diving. Um, and that's precisely what they do. The The area um, just to the west of Trinidad, around Margarita, Cubagua, and Coche, um, it's very shallow, very warm water. In some places, it's only about 10 feet deep. It doesn't generally go more than 30 or 40 feet deep, and so it's very warm um, and ideal for the production of uh, three or four different species of, of, of pearl oysters. Um, and so basically by the 1520s, what you have is a kind of joint pearling and slaving operation um, where the Spanish are bringing in hundreds of enslaved people from around the Caribbean and also slaving locally in order to get as many divers as possible. And a lot of enslaved people die pretty horrible deaths. I didn't want to talk about that in this paper, but there are um, in, in these documents that I've been working with absolutely horrific descriptions of what it's like to, to drown in your own blood because your heart is exploding because you've gone too deep. Um, and it's really, really awful. Um, and so, but this essentially the Spanish, um, because of this pearl fishery, they, they made many of the, the pearl oyster species in that region extinct um, by the end of the 16th century. 
Um, and there's a, a terrible scene in one of my documents where um, there were middens on, on the island of Cubagua that probably had billions of oyster shells. Um, and they had enslaved people just crawling over them, looking through the discarded oyster shells, um, trying to find any pearls that might have been overlooked. Um, and you can imagine that the filth and the stinkingness of this. Um, and so they moved from place to place. By the 1570s, they're in Cabo de la Vela, which is in present-day Colombia. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're going to different, um, different shallow waters looking for pearls. Thanks, Rebecca, for all the grisly I, I hope details. That, I hope that kind yeah, of that, contextualizes that's, 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 that. A lot of grisly details there. Um, there's a great book by Molly Walsh also on, on pearls, yeah. pearls in this area, which we could. Um, I've got a couple of questions which are related, one by Abigail Bernard, Bernard and one from Patricia R Richardson, They're really about how indigenous linguistic matters. Um, I think it's for Rebecca and Linford in particular. Um, Abigail asks, is, were people, were, were enslaved indigenous people going to Jamaica? I think she means, she also asked for other places. Uh, were they able to speak English? And Patricia Richardson asks, um, linguistically, were enslaved people from different indigenous groups able to communicate with one another when they've been trafficked elsewhere? Um, and, 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 and perhaps you might want to dis discuss that in relationship to the archives of, uh, of, of indigenous people. So, Linford? Yes, yeah, so great question. Um, most of the people that I'm looking at in these court cases are have been enslaved for multiple generations, and so the the sort of ability to communicate in in English is not seemingly an issue at all. Um, and I think that that's a very particular moment uh, in the 1820s that that this sort of brings about. But I've there's lots of other evidence earlier. Um, in uh, the Mosquito Shore, but also other places as well. Um, you know, looking at runaway slave ads, for example, or self-emancipated ads, sometimes you get uh, little indicators of linguistic ability um, that an ad will say, you know, can't speak English or speaks only French or something like that if this person could transship from the Caribbean or somewhere else. Um, so it's not, uh, it's, it's just, it's as you would expect that there are, uh, there's a lot of forced mobility, a lot of forced transshipments, and when you have people extracted from communal and family contexts uh, and then thrust into foreign uh, international contexts, there's going to be a period of, um, of, of linguistic challenge, obviously. And, and what's amazing to me, though, is how, how quickly, um, not even in enslavement contexts, but other kinds of trade contexts, uh, there's rudimentary you know, communication, I guess it takes place over time. Um, so yeah, I think language is really an important question, but uh, when you have multi-generational enslavement situations, um, it's not really a factor so much. Rebecca? Yeah, the, the question of language um, for the 16th century Caribbean is a little fraught um, because historical linguists have divided indigenous languages into Arawak and Arcaraban, for example, and then historians and anthropologists and others have tried to attach particular ethnicities to particular languages in ways that we are now discovering are, are rather distortive of the actual lived experience of um, indigenous people in the Caribbean in this period. Um, so that one of the groups of, of people that I am studying, um, the, the Guayquerís, um, their language is no longer extant, but there are a few phrases that are recorded here and there, and it shows characteristics of a what of what historical linguists think are a wide variety of different um, Caribbean languages. Um, so it's it seems likely to me that a lot of these people could talk to each other um, fairly easily, even if they came from radically different parts of the Caribbean, um, because indigenous mobility prior to contact is also pretty well established. There are trade routes and established diplomatic relationships. Um, and so language, these people could talk to one another, um, and Spanish people did struggle um, to understand indigenous languages. It was actually um, um, Franciscans and Dominicans um, who learned indigenous languages and were able to communicate fully. By the 1570s, in the period that I'm working in, most of these ensla enslaved people spoke enough Castilian in order to be able to talk to um, a judge. Um, and they did have linguists available, so so translators um, who could translate um, indigenous people's words um, into Castilian, and that's how they get recorded um, in the archive. There's no kind of 
we wrote down what they said in the indigenous language first and then we put up um then we'll put the spanish no they just put the spanish um which is so frustrating and distortive right because it's um um you you wonder how much of it is actually coming from the person being interviewed and how much of it is being um you know being ventriloquized by by a notary but you know that's an unanswerable kind of question right i've got two final questions um i have one for brooke first and then one for for linford um Brock, the, the question is from Judith, is uh, if the British had a different idea of the enslavability of Indigenous peoples, did this make any difference the way the Indigenous enslaved were treated? Or was it easier to think of the enslaved as non-Indigenous? Well, I think it depends on the context, because in cases where people have been enslaved for generations and are, are being referred to as other slaves, um, they can be in, in the fields, they can be in a domestic scenario, but in this particular case that I'm looking at, she, her mother, and actually, um, so Polly, her mother, and her daughters, all of them were enslaved domestics. And that's actually a really critical part of the story because one of the things that she's, which I didn't get into in my presentation, that she's very concerned about is that she will be sold when her master potentially uh, goes back to England or that they'll just sell them on or they'll be inherited and still sold on, which is of course a valid concern. And that if that happens, they will be stripped of a relatively privileged position in this domestic situation in the capital and sent to labor on a sugar estate or some other kind of um, agricultural estate where the death rate is extremely high. Um, and especially in Tobago, it ha already has a very high death rate. So I see her claim in particular as a matter of life and death for both herself, but primarily for her children and her grandchildren and her descendants. Like she's she's really thinking strategically ahead of we have been able to occupy um, a relatively privileged position. And this she claims that because her mother was was native um, of native descent, and because her father was a so-called mulatto footman, that's how he's described, they are lighter skinned, they're clearly um, distinct racially from um, others, field hands, and so they should be treated a certain way. And she's concerned that she may not be. And so I think that's a, a good question. And it's also part of, I think what makes these cases um, unique is that what pushes someone to, to make a freedom claim varies depending on the context. Great, thanks, Brooke. Uh, and, and Linford, I predicted that, that uh, your provocative remark at the end would lead to a question, and this comes from Gad Human. Uh, it was great to see Gad here. My question, he, his question, he says, is for Linford, could you expand upon your argument that this was a test case for emancipation? Was it referred to by abolitionists? Yeah, great. Well, I almost made it through without actually getting pushed on this point, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to expand. It's it's really just um, something I'm, I'm kind of toying with, and uh, you know, there's there's uh, so I, th I think the bottom line is I, I have not found anyone sitting in London saying, "Hey, we we gave this a whirl and uh, it worked in in British Honduras, and so we're gonna sort of go with it." Um, but that doesn't always mean that. that people aren't uh, thinking about this, referring to this in other kinds of ways. I mean, it's interesting because I think for a long time, people didn't think that indigenous enslavement had any part in the conversations in the 1770s with abolitionism. And actually there are a few distinct connections, uh, you know, that I and other people have been trying to work on and, and, and uh, extrapolate out. And so um, just because it's not self-evidently in the official documents of uh, you know, the 1833 Act, for example, it doesn't mean that there aren't people who are aware of the situation. When you have the, you know, these commissioners for legal inquiry making these rounds and getting involved in the case that Brooke's talking about or the case that I'm talking about, um, I think that matters, right? And, and that gets back uh, in different kinds of ways. And it's not that, I mean, it, it, slaveholders have been compensated for slave losses before. Uh, I, I get that point too, but it's so it's so significant to me that this is um, the only instance I'm aware of, but I'm sure someone who will watch this later will email me and say, you forgot this one case, and I'd be happy to hear about it. But I don't know of any other instance where there is sort of like this kind of colony-wide uh, manumission 
of a whole sort of subset of the enslaved population um, with all the same kind of features that you see in 1834, right? Especially the compensation bit. Um, and that gets negotiated in the 1820s in Honduras in a very specific way that pacifies. It's the only thing that allows this to move forward on the part of, of the enslavers. So I can't prove it at the moment. This is no smoking gun. My book doesn't hinge on this. I just think it's really fascinating and it's something I want to keep on thinking about. And maybe if somebody listening or watching this later has some additional tips uh, for me, that'd be great. Thanks. Great. Thanks very much, much Lynn. For, uh, and I think I think it's just see it's test me the quality of the uh, of the contributions today that we've had questions for everybody and also very interesting and challenging questions. Uh, so my thanks very much, uh, firstly, to Brooke for organising this uh, and to Sandy, Rebecca and Linford uh, and to Brooke as a speaker for their fantastic talks and for expanding uh, on our ideas of slavery. So thank you very much for people attending. And I just have a, a couple of things to say about uh, about future events that we have, have coming. Uh, on Thursday, the 7th of April, so next week, at the same time as we're having a uh, a, a, a conference on uh, the Oxford Handbook of the Seven Years' War. Uh, Dr. Sherilyn Haggerty, who is an honorary research fellow at the Wilberforce Institute, uh, will be talking about tales of the enslaved uh, in 1756. On the 20th to 21st of April, we have uh, an in-person conference, um, which, for, which, is, uh, um, which is an early American slavery conference. And those of, us, those of you who have been interested in today's talk uh, may be very interested in hearing uh, Brett Rushford of the University of Oregon, uh, who's a leading uh, scholar on indigenous slavery, Bonds of Alliance is one of the pioneering works in this way. Then on the 28th of April, uh, which, is a, uh, a, which is a rescheduled event, uh, we have uh, Professor Geraldine Van Buren, uh, QC, who's talking about class discrimination and children's rights. Uh, so we have three events in April, 7th of April, 20th and 21st of April, and the 28th of April. Um, so thank you. So I hope we can, many of you can join us for those events, uh, but we'd like to, I'd like to conclude by thanking uh, everybody for turning up uh, and in particular for our four speakers uh, for a, a wonderful session. Thank you very much, uh, Sandy, Brooke, uh, Rebecca and Linford.